jump into the shower for about an hour. Oh, it was fine. Yeah, it helps me all the time. Hello, students, and welcome back to another exciting installment in our Money and Banking Lecture Series. Today, we're going to talk about monetary policy transmission mechanisms and lags also known as the channels by which monetary policy influences the economy. So how does monetary policy influence the economy? What we're asking is changes in the policy tool. So for example, with the Fed, that would be changing the target interest rate, the federal funds rate, and then having maybe a cascading change in other mostly short-term interest rates. Although, as we've discussed, the Fed can also influence long-term interest rates with tools like quantitative easing. So how do changes in that policy tool influence the policy targets that the Fed cares about? The Fed has a dual mandate and is targeting low stable inflation and maximum sustainable employment, which of course coincides with um, high GDP growth. We want to investigate five different channels or mechanisms by which monetary policy impacts the economy. And we'll look at them in this order. Interest rates, exchange rates, bank lending, corporate and household balance sheets slash net worth, and then wealth effects. So let's look at interest rates first. Now, interest rates is maybe kind of the obvious channel. You might expect when the Fed lowers interest rates, uh, we march down a demand schedule, demand curve for borrowing, and people borrow more. And as people borrow more, people spend more. And as people spend more, aggregate demand goes up. So we're pretty familiar with this in terms of a loanable funds market. We have the interest rate as the price. We have a quantity of loanable funds per time period. We have a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. And here's this level of interest rates let's call it I star equilibrium and quantity let's just call it Q star and the Fed undertakes some uh, expansionary monetary policy with a I on pushing the interest rate target down to I2 which of course is going to push us out on the demand curve to Q2 and we've got an increase in lending slash borrowing and if that happens of course an increase in spending holding everything else constant Okay, and for consumers, that's going to be specifically an increase in durable goods spending, the kind of products that consumers need to borrow money to buy. You're probably not going to see more spending on groceries because most people are going to pay for those out of their cash, out of their current incomes. But you might be see an increase in uh, borrowing for purchases of cars, homes, major products, etc. And for businesses, there's a feasibly an increase in investment spending because businesses would be utilizing bank loans for those kind of purposes. The obvious impact here is actually modest. It's actually pretty small in reality for several reasons. And there's been a lot of empirical uh, research and surveys and tr tracking of actual spending that, uh, that demonstrates this. Households, durable goods purchases decisions, and business investment decisions depend primarily on longer term interest rates rather than the short run interest rates that are these um, influenced by monetary policy. And consumption decisions will only change to the extent that we get an impact on long-term rates. And those are generally viewed as being driven by market forces more so than the Fed. Although maybe the Fed can have some influence on longer-term rates when the Fed engages in uh, alternate policy frameworks like quantitative easing. Nonetheless, we're going to have very marginal impacts on consumer spending and business investment through the traditional interest rate channel. So interest rate channel is not very powerful. And the investment component of total spending isn't very sensitive to interest rates. What it is sensitive to is profitability, right? So if firms are profitable, if interest rates are low, well, if profitability goes up, they might increase borrowing. If firms are profitable and profitability goes up and interest rates are high, firms might increase borrowing as well because what matters is the relative profitability of a business's investment opportunities more so than the absolute level of interest rates because you can be profitable in a high interest rate environment or a low interest rate environment. So we're not going to say the interest rate channel is irrelevant. We're just going to say it doesn't have a large impact. So let's move on to some other channels that might be more relevant. Exchange rates is another uh, one that has historically been considered. It, what happens with monetary easing or expansionary monetary policy 
is lower domestic interest rates and a decrease in the value of the domestic currency. So in our case, if the Fed acts to cut interest rates, that's going to ultimately cause a decline in the value of the international exchange value of the US dollar, other things held constant. And the reason for that, just in a nutshell, is that at lower interest rates, and especially if US interest rates go down relative to other countries' interest rates, well, there's going to be less demand for dollar-denominated investments because the return on those investments is lower. So people might want to take money out of, for example, US Treasury bonds, who, the Treasury bills, whose interest rate is going down, and put them into um, British government bonds or, or German bonds or Japanese bonds, whose interest rates would be relatively higher, so they'd, they'd be lower relative demand for dollars and higher relative demand for euros or British pounds or Japanese yen or what have you. Okay, and then a less valuable dollar is going to drive up the cost of imports, which would reduce imports and make American products for export more attractive. So that would increase exports and reduce imports. And that would lead to an increased uh, GDP growth because as you might recall from macro, we can think about GDP in terms of consumption spending, investment spending, government purchases and net exports, which of course is exports minus imports. And what this policy here does is increases exports and reduces imports. So that would lead to an increase in that net exports component of GDP. Now, how relevant is the net exports component in GDP? And then how much of an impact does monetary policy have on the value of the dollar and therefore the size of net exports? Well, the answer is not much. There's a lot of factors that shift demand and supply for the dollar and influence the exchange rate. And then net exports is a relatively small component of total GDP. So again, this traditional exchange rate channel is found to not be all that powerful a tool of monetary policy. But evidence shows that monetary policy overall is effective, so we need to keep looking for even more channels that might have more influence. And so let's keep moving on. And now let's get into maybe some of the meatier channels, starting with bank lending. Okay, what happens when the Fed injects reserves into the economy in the quest for reducing interest rates? Well, banks have more funds to lend, and under normal circumstances, banks will want to lend those funds. So as we can remember from our discussion of open market operations, with open market purchases, the Fed is buying government bonds from banks and supplying them with fresh reserves, and banks are going to lend out those fresh reserves according to their reserve requirements, and that increase in reserves is going to increase both credit and lending and the money supply. So the Fed can do this through open market operations, and then the regulatory agencies, which includes the Fed, and then there's a few others, can also influence bank lending practices through easing or tightening regulatory strictures on bank lending. So there's uh, two ways institutions like the Federal Reserve can influence bank lending. And it's pretty well known and well experienced that credit conditions, the both the price of credit and just the ease of getting a loan approved will ease in boom periods and periods of strong growth and, and high confidence and then tighten in periods of recession and declining growth. So to summarize the bank lending channel, it's going to be through the increase in lending and then spending, which happens when the Fed increases the money supply, when the Fed takes actions to increase the amount of reserves in the banking system. That's going to have the biggest and most direct impact on consumer spending, aggregate demand, inflation, output, and employment. Okay, but that's not all. So let's move on and talk about the balance sheet or net worth channel. Monetary policy has a direct influence on the net worth of potential borrowers. That is the uh, value of their assets minus the value of their liabilities. And what happens with monetary easing, a reduction in interest rates, increase in money growth, is that we see uh, improvement or increase in people's net worth. And with higher net worth, people's credit risk goes down because they have more asset, more value of assets to meet their liabilities. Banks like increases in net worth because that reduces moral hazard and adverse selection, right? If we're in a situation where everybody's net worth is increasing over time, well, if you lend long to a person whose net worth is increasing over time, the risk of that loan actually goes down over time because that person's acquiring more and more asset value over time with which uh, he or she can, can meet liabilities. And so we're, that would contribute to the easing of credit conditions that we were just talking about a minute ago. Now, 
this should be very familiar to us because we've talked about the impact of interest rates on asset prices quite a bit. And if you were wondering, why are we doing all this finance and time value stuff in this class? Well, here's, here's why. Because we want to be very familiar with the impact of a change in interest rates on asset values. Right? So what does expansionary monetary policy do? Well, it reduces interest rates, and that reduction in interest rates will tend, other things held constant, to drive up asset prices, whether we're talking about stocks, bonds, houses, land, business assets, etc. And that impact will increase the asset side of the balance sheet relative to the liability side and lead to an increase in equity or net worth. Furthermore, lower interest rates themselves make it easier for people to service their debts or they can actually drive down the cost of debt on the liability side of the ledger and we can see that two ways um, people with variable loans will enjoy lower interest costs interest payments at lower interest rates and then also inflation that could accompany expansionary monetary policy will drive people's real debt burdens down and regard that alone, regardless of whether their payments changed or not, would cause their debt burden to decline. Okay, and then this leads us to the issue of wealth effects. So wealth effects is closely related to the uh, concept of the balance sheet or net worth channel that we had just been discussing. Wealth effects you can kind of think about as the consequence of the improvements in business and household net worth that can happen through expansionary monetary policy. When the interest rate moves, so, so do stock prices, as uh, Bocephus has taught us. The interest is up and the stock market's down, and you're only getting mugged if you go downtown. And of course, that works in the opposite direction, too. When interest rates go down, asset values go up. And those higher stock prices are going to lead people to see increases in their nominal wealth and the increase in the nominal wealth might lead them to be willing to spend more and save less. Likewise, we might see reductions in uh, borrowing costs for consumer debt, such as mortgages. And through this channel here, we're going to see that lead to higher home prices. And you can basically think of that in this manner. If mortgage rates go down, you know, you, you might realize, like, I want to spend $1,000 a month on my home or $1,500 a month on my home. Well, if mortgage rates go down, the interest component of that payment is going to be less. That means the principal component can be higher, and that means you can borrow more money. So people are willing to borrow more money. People are willing to spend more on a home at a lower interest rate. Right. So we have asset values rising potentially across the board and as a consequence of expansionary monetary policy of the Fed cutting interest rates. And that is going to lead to an increase in wealth. And then for reasons I had just mentioned, higher consumption, other things held constant. Right? If I have, you know, let's say I have $100,000 in my stock portfolio, but that value rises to a million dollars within a few years. I, I maybe thought it would take me 10 years to get to a million dollars, but what if it gets to a million dollars in two years? Well, I can kind of kick back and, and throttle my savings way down because I've, I've, I'm way ahead of my plan. And if I'm throttling my savings down because my wealth rose unexpectedly, well, that means I'm gonna be spending more, right? That means I can go and kind of flaunt my new wealth and, and you know buy some fancier cars and some fancier clothes and, and live it up a little. So maybe that's a little cartoonish way of describing it, but that's, that's ultimately kind of what the Fed is expecting to happen here through these wealth effects. Okay, so let's just summarize uh, monetary policy channels here in a simple table. And if you're uh, studying here in, in the money and banking class, you might want to pause on this slide and take a couple notes. Okay, we've got interest rates and exchange rates, traditional channels. Okay. Lower interest rates, more lending, more spending. Lower interest rates, lower value of the domestic currency, which is a boon to exports and a detriment to imports, so we, we're probably going to see some increase in net exports. Okay, but, but these are kind of the minor ones. Major ones down here would be bank lending, more lending, more spending at lower interest rates, just because, not because the price has gone down necessarily in terms of lower interest rates, but just because the quantity of, of reserves, the quantity of loanable funds has increased. So pretty major one there. And then the balance sheet slash net worth effect we have the Bocephus principle at work. Lower interest rates mean higher asset values, and that increases people's willingness to spend.
there's there's a lot of things listed here but there's really only a couple of key principles at work so if you understand some basic supply demand economics you can work your way through those interest rate and exchange rate effects and then if you understand the relationship of interest rates and asset prices you should have a pretty good handle on the balance sheet net worth and asset price effects or the wealth effects okay now I want to conclude this lecture by talking briefly about policy lags uh, monetary policy works with a lag and there's several components of the lag and what we mean by a lag is that well it takes time for once a policy change has been decided upon for it to be both implemented and then for it to have the desired effect on the economy. In the meantime, the underlying data that drove the particular policy change might, might have changed as well. And so we could wind up having monetary policy that's insufficient to meet the current economic conditions, or that is uh, an overreaction to the conditions. Because for example, if you have a recession, a, a nascent recession, and the Fed starts to see signs of that, and then they cut interest rates, and they try to have expansionary monetary policy and increase in spending and increase in demand, increase in borrowing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, maybe the recession takes care of itself. It was a mild recession. There was self-correcting forces in the economy. And by the time the Fed realizes the recession has occurred and then implements a counter-cyclical policy, the economy has healed, so to speak, on its own, and growth is back. And now the Fed's pro-growth policies are going to hit the economy and cause maybe an excessive increase in growth and inflationary boom. And one thing I wanted to note here about all these uh, channels of monetary policy is that the, they're all short-run impacts. If the Fed continues, or a central bank in general, continues to, to, to attempt to stimulate its economy, whether it's through an interest rate channel or a bank lending channel or a wealth effects channel or what have you, you, you can't just do that continually by continually lowering interest rates. Continually, continually lowering interest rates and increasing total spending is in the end just going to give you higher and higher and higher inflation. And ultimately, you know, we get the revenge of Irving Fisher and interest rates will start to rise due to the higher inflation. Remember, the Fisher equation. I, the nominal interest rate, equals the real interest rate plus expected inflation. As actual inflation goes up, expected inflation goes up, nominal interest rates go up. And so if the Fed overdoes its stimulus and winds up creating too much inflation, we could have nominal interest rates rise, we could have nominal interest rates start to overshoot and then real interest rates rise as well and then the feds or the central bank's stimulative efforts become counterproductive so you want to beware of using any of these instruments too much but with that being said let's talk about the lags okay so first we have a data lag how current is the information we have about inflation growth employment etc well at the earliest we get that maybe a month later uh, with uh, unemployment and inflation. With GDP, we might not get that until a quarter later, and then that's constantly revised. So we, we're kind of in the dark in real time about what the situation of the economy is. Sometimes. Sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. Okay, recognition. Now we see inflation rates start to move up slightly. Well, is that a sign of a long-term uptrend in inflation, or is that just an anomaly? Is that just a short-term one-off thing? Well, you have to usually get more than one month's data to recognize a trend and if you wait too long to recognize a trend well then maybe you've waited too long and it's going to be more difficult to unwind that uh, one reason by the way the fed likes to use core inflation is because core inflation is usually much less volatile than headline inflation and maybe therefore more indicative of longer term trends decision time now decision is probably the least relevant lag for monetary policy because the fed uh, has regular meetings eight times a year, but the Fed can meet on an extraordinary basis whenever they want. So the FOMC in particular, the Open Market Committee can meet. So if there's an economic crisis brewing, the Fed, the Open Market Committee can meet right now and then decide to take action. So the decision lag, not very important in monetary policy. If we were talking about fiscal policy, decision lag for the for a government, the legislature to meet. So Congress might have to meet and pass some kind of resolution or bill through both the House and the Senate with a lot of debate and 
potential for filibuster and discussion and scrutiny. So the decision lag will be highly relevant for fiscal policy, not too relevant at all for monetary policy. Transmission, how long then does it take for people to have the expected reactions to the change in the policy? So how long before banks increase their lending, businesses increase their borrowing, businesses in the public increase their spending in, in response to expansionary policy or vice versa if the Fed decides to tighten because it's done too much expansion previously and inflation's rising and nominal interest rates are rising too much and pushing real interest rates up. Well, then the Fed has to reverse course and undertake contractionary measures. Well, how long does it take for people to react to that? Reduce their borrowing, spending, expectations of inflation, and so on. Might take a while, might take several years. How long does it take for the plan to work out? That's the effect in this lag. And then kind of re start to repeat the cycle the fed has to evaluate then readjust its policy now milton friedman uh, a great monetary economist whose name i'm sure you've heard me mention was very keen on noting the relevance of these lags and he had a lot of uh, published research back in the uh, 1960s and 70s that said well these lags might be one to two years and then importantly they're long and variable so the lag's not always going to be the same one time the lag might be six months next time around the, ne the next economic crisis or recession the lag might be two years so not only are there lags and, and long lags but they're variable so we don't even know how long the lags are so what does that mean well uh, i'll just summarize briefly the potential impact of this with reference to the idiot in the shower metaphor so the idiot in the shower imagine you get into the shower and you want to take a nice hot shower so you turn the hot water valve on, but you realize that, but the water coming out of the shower head doesn't get hot immediately. Now, you probably know that's because your water heater in your house is not right next to your bathroom. In my case, I uh, have my bathroom up on the third floor and my water heater's down in the basement. So my water from my water heater to get up to the shower head to make my shower hot has to go almost 30 feet has to rise almost 30 feet through the pipe and that's going to take a little bit of time it has to be has to flow through the pipe now if i were an idiot and i didn't realize that i might think well i just haven't turned the hot valve up high enough right so i crank the hot valve up a little bit more well i'm still waiting for the water to come from the heater to my shower head if i'm an idiot and don't realize that i turn the hot valve up a little more right and still not hot a little bit more still not hot so i crank the hot valve up to max and then by the time the hot water starts flowing through the hot pipes up to the shower head well it hits me as full hot and i'm scalding and i'm uh, very uncomfortable so now I crank the cold valve up right and I crank the cold valve up now the cold water the water in the pipes is always relatively cold so that might not have as much of a lag but if I don't respect the lags I'm gonna be sitting there turning the hot and cold valves and fiddling with it and maybe not actually stabilizing the water temperature for quite a while I imagine that if you've lived in a place for for any length of time you kind of get accustomed to the lag and if you're anything like me, you dial the hot water valve to where you, about where you think it should be. You dial the cold water valve to, to where experience tells you it should be. Then you wait maybe 30 seconds or a minute, let that water temperature stabilize. Then you can step in and take a nice comfortable shower. Okay. So if you know the lags, you can anticipate them and then they don't necessarily harm you. If you don't know the lags, not just because the lags are there because they're variable and they change well then your actions can potentially be destabilizing and that's what we might see the fed doing with the economy i don't want to belabor this discussion of the lags too much it is pretty important i just want us to be aware that lags can make monetary policy both very difficult to implement and potentially destabilizing whereas the fed is claiming to exert a stabilizing influence on the economy and if we look at the path of in policy interest rate and here's the federal funds rate going back for the past 60 plus years well there's a lot of variability in that isn't there so the, the question remains is the fed a stabilizing force or a destabilizing force i'm not going to attempt to answer that question right now i just want us to think about that question as we evaluate the effectiveness of monetary policy which we'll do Subsequent. All right, now push the aquamarine button. The aquamarine button? The, aqua, the aquamarine button, yeah. Okay. It's not doing it. Oh, aquamarine? Yeah, aqua, aquamarine. Okay. Suck!
It says engaged, engaged. That should be that should be good. Okay, um, the water's not running. Should it be going right now? 